Good afternoon, everyone. I am Belinda Cheesborough, STEM Education Specialist at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm here to share the stories of African Americans and the impacts they've had and continue to have on American culture because of their STEM contributions. Through the Window and Into the Mirror is a video conversation series about the experiences of African American STEM professionals today. This time around, we are focusing on innovation, advocacy, and advancement in the field of tech. During our sessions together, students will peer into the windows of their speakers' lives and learn from their lived experiences. They will also find parts of their culture and lifestyle mirrored in their stories. To everyone listening, it is our hope that you leave here with information, inspiration, and plans for action as you take your first steps toward having careers in STEM. Now, let's meet our speaker. Dr. Geraldine Izika is a fellow at Flagship Pioneering, a venture creation firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They ideate and conceptualize novel biotech companies such as Moderna, which was founded by the CEO of Flagship, Nubar Afayan. Excited about learning about the STEM world beyond academia, she is the EVP of Culture for Nucleate, a nonprofit organization that educates and inspires the next generation of biotech innovators. Passionate about using STEM as a tool for social justice, she is the social media coordinator for Vanguard STEM, the premier program of the STEM on Route to Change, otherwise known as the Search Foundation, founded by Dr. Jedida Eisler. Within Vanguard STEM, she is also the program manager of Hot Science Summer, an initiative to encourage STEM creatives of all stages and ages to pursue their research curiosities. She received her bachelor's in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in 2016, and her PhD in the same discipline from the University of Maryland, Baltimore this past spring. Welcome, Dr. Azika. I'm so excited to speak with you today while engaging the stu teachers, students, and family of students watching this interview. Now, Let's move on to our first question. So please tell us about your work, what you do, and anything else you think is important for us to know. First and foremost, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to be here and help educate and inspire the next generation of Black STEMinists and STEM creatives. Um, currently, I literally just finished my flagship fellowship last Friday, oh, exactly a week from today. Uh, during that, we were literally ideating and exploring different topics, trying to create new what flagship calls platform companies. And this essentially means that we're not trying to come up with a single product. We're kind of trying to come up with a technology that could be used for multiple different products. For example, at Moderna, they came up with using mRNAs um, as a way to treat different types of diseases like creating the COVID vaccine out of mRNA. That could be done potentially with a bunch of different types of, or a bunch of different types of diseases. Um, in addition to my work at Flagship, I am also, as you mentioned, the EVP of Culture at Nuclear, a nonprofit organization. And we recently, earlier this week, just launched our uh, first ever Nuclear Summit, which I was a part of the organization and managing team. Um, it was a really great opportunity for us to bring our entire community together for the very first time after working virtually together. And I am also a part of uh, Vanguard STEM. I'm the social media coordinator. Last year, we launched our Hot Science Summer Initiative, which brought STEM creatives of all stages and ages the opportunity to do science their way. Um, we invited them to submit research-driven hypotheses or, yeah, research-driven hypotheses so that they could pursue whatever research interests that they have. So all of that boils down to just like all of my different passions for bringing anybody who is interested in STEM into the, into, um, the STEM world, because uh, anybody could be a scientist. That is amazing. You have been doing so much in the past few years. That is just so cool. And congratulations on finishing up your fellowship. Thank you. Yeah. So 
let's move on to talking about your childhood. Tell us about your young self and if you had any interest in STEM while growing up. Yeah, so um, I am the middle child of five. My amazing Nigerian parents came here over 30 years ago um, and I have three sisters and a twin brother. Um, growing up, my dad actually nicknamed me Socrates because all I used to do was ask questions. Um, I like to tell people that I am like, you don't even have to be smart to be a scientist. You just always have to be confused and always willing to just ask the questions so that you're no longer confused anymore. Because the more you ask, the more you find out. So I was, my dad literally to this day still calls me Socrates because I was always asking questions. And as a kid, I thought that I actually wanted to be a neurosurgeon or an oncologist. I thought I wanted to practice medicine. I remember 10th grade chemistry class, um, my teacher, Miss Young, she, uh, she exposed this element to oxygen and it erupted in flames. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna be a chemist. I am going to be someone that does that for a living. Um, and then I went into undergrad still thinking that I wanted to do chemistry um, as a major. And I actually was a chemistry major until I decided to switch over to biochemistry because it was just a little bit more encompassing of like medical health. Um, Cause I ultimately decided, thought I wanted to go to medical school. Um, and then I got exposed to research. And I realized that it was actually the scientists that were the people coming up with new ways to treat diseases. My entire childhood, I thought that those were physicians that did that. And it wasn't until I got into a lab and had lab experiences was, was, uh, was when I learned that it's actually the scientists that are like breaking down these diseases at the smallest level and trying to figure out how exactly to treat not just the symptoms, but the actual um, breakdown of the disease. And that's when I realized that um, the PhD in research was my way to go. Wow, that is so amazing. So that, that actually touches on a very important point that I think people just like what you mentioned, don't realize about physicians, that they are the ones practicing medicine. They're the ones implementing these ideas that were thought of in the lab and researched. So that's a really excellent point that you made there. Of course, and don't get me wrong, there are physicians that do both. There are MD PhDs or MDs that so that do research as well. But I I I don't it's crazy how you don't realize that these different ex careers exist until you're around other people that do it, right? I didn't know that there was a such career that would allow me to just just ask questions and then go seek the answers to those questions. Once I learned that, I was like, wow, my dad hasn't been calling me Socrates my whole life for nothing. <laughs> that is amazing. So you touched on a bit about these positive experiences you had. And you said, when did you have that research experience? That was when you got to undergrad or was and it earlier in high school? It was actually really late in my undergraduate career. So technically, you know, a lot of students coming into undergrad actually have a lot of research experiences as early as high school, as early as their first year, second year, and then throughout their undergraduate career. It was really difficult. I'm not gonna lie. It was really difficult for me to get into a lab. I'm cold emailing people after people after people. Um, most of the time I was not getting a response back. Other times I was getting a response back, but they didn't have space or time to mentor additional students. It wasn't until um, I talked to my dad about how I was interested in researching. And he was like, your uncle used to work at your school. And I was like, what? <laughs> so he informed me of another PI, Dr. Michael Summers, who um, he was close with. I emailed him, told him that my uncles asked me to reach out. And that was literally how I ended up researching at a lab in the summer. Shout out to my uncle Ashwell. Um, because I had literally been emailing people, people after pe person after person, PI after PI. And it was incredibly difficult just to get into a lab. I didn't get into a lab until my junior, the summer of my junior year, which is technically kind of considered late. I had the opportunity to be in that lab for about a year. 
And then I actually took a year off after undergrad to do more research because I wasn't sure if my research experiences were adequate enough for me to get into graduate school. And I wanted to diversify my research experiences. So I did a what they call a post-baccalaureate research education program at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine, where I had an additional year of research experiences before applying to um, graduate school. Wow. Yeah. So you actually touched on um, some of the questions that I have later, but we will come back to this because that, that was an amazing like journey you had there just before going into grad school. So let's talk a little bit more about your childhood. So you mentioned a couple of positive experiences that obviously have later um, inspired you to pursue the career that you're currently on. Mm -hmm. So just growing up, being very curious about the world around you and especially having this curiosity towards biology and medicine and yeah. how diseases work and things like that. So um, what other positive STEM experiences did you have while growing up? Um, I have always been exposed to STEM. My, my father is a professor uh, at Coppin State University. So he's always kind of encouraged us to continue pursuing knowledge and education. Um, at Morgan State University, they actually had these summer programs for high school students that my parents took each of us into. And it was really cool because we got the opportunity to learn different types of STEM that we were not exposed to, such as engineering. Um, I was in some uh, different like STEM based competitions when I was in like middle school and elementary school. So I had always kind of had a really great appreciation of science and math. I loved math all throughout. Um, when I was a kid, I was like a math nerd, those like times tables. I was like, sign me up. I would love to do them. And then um, I also was in this program. Um, sorry, the name of the program is escaping me, but it allowed us to get together with a bunch of other um, youth to do, to create like robots and do other like engineering based things. So again, it just, I had a lot of different um, exposures to STEM that really helped me kind of like make me really passionate for STEM. I also went to, in Baltimore, they have these things called magnet schools. So I went to a magnet high school where my magnet was environmental science. And it was really cool because we got the opportunity to be exposed to a bunch of different types of sciences that we normally wouldn't be exposed to unless you were in the magnet program. So while the main curricula for students was like um, biology, chemistry, and physics, I was also exposed to ecology, environmental science, and zoology. And we used to go outside a lot. It gave me a really great appreciation, not just for science, but also for nature. So I, I like to call myself a Lorax. I tell people I speak for the trees. <laughs> so um, all of those different experiences really allowed me to just have a really great appreciation for science. Um, also, me and my brother, we're kind of like, we were kind of knuckleheads when we grew up. So anytime you would see us with a wrench, it meant that we were about to start taking things apart. My parents, weren't exactly, you know, keen for it. Sorry, mom and dad. But um, we used to take things apart and then put them back together. So it was cool. Maybe I should have been an engineer. You never know. But my brother ended up going into IT. So it was really cool to kind of have like those real life experiences. Um, we also used to do, please do not do this at home. But like we used to kind of like experiment um, in chemistry, in our chemistry class, we used to experiment with like fire and the different types of colors that you could get with fire based on the different elements that the fire is being exposed to. So you think that red and orange fire is just a thing? No, there's blue, there's orange, like the hottest flames are actually blue. Don't touch it, it's, it's very hot. But it's really cool to kind of see that when you're a kid only thinking that there's one type of fire and there's like, no, if you expose it to different elements, it'll actually like light up in different colors and that's how fireworks work. So, I don't know, it's so cool. It sounds like you lived the dream childhood of just being exposed to all these different programs and also just your school curriculum too, like catering to your desires to just learn more about the world around you. For sure, so that's just for really sure. Awesome. And you know, like, 
even when there's not like a lot of those programs around us, you know, my parents did their due diligence to seek them out because they really wanted us to be informed and educated in any way we could, in, in any way we possibly could be, you know, um, getting us like student workbooks during the summertime so that we were like doing anything, whether it was reading, writing, um, math problems during the summertime to make sure that even if school was out, we still had something to do. It's an excellent point that you made there because I think parents are like the biggest part of like immersing a child into STEM because I, okay. I identify that with greatly because if my dad didn't take me to the planetarium or to the nature center, would I have been an astrophysicist? Who knows? I might have come later. So yeah, that's really cool. And yes, shouts to your parents for doing such a great job and immersing you in so many different things. Um, so that actually leads into my next question about who were your biggest role models slash influences growing up? So obviously parents is one of them. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, like my my dad is probably, my dad and my mom are probably two of my, my biggest influences. My oldest sister is also one of my biggest influences. She had she was probably the first person that I saw go into a STEM career as a black woman in STEM. She, well, technically tech, but she was a computer science and math major um, growing up or in undergrad. And um, she's now like a project manager for her company. And it's amazing to see like her growth and matriculation over the years because being a computer science major is not an easy task. And it was really, for a lot of these different careers, it's not exactly like a clear cut path for where you can go with these different topics. So it was really interesting to kind of see her navigate what she wanted to do after um, graduating. Like she could have easily gone to a Google and IBM, but she actually started at a smaller place and is now like at a really high position at a startup. So it's really inspiring to see her go through that matriculation um, so she's always been one of my, my biggest inspirations. And then my parents, they came here from Nigeria and like, I mean, everybody's parents is their inspiration, but my parents came here from Nigeria and my dad, he started undergrad when I finished grad school. I finished grad school at 27 years old and my dad came from Nigeria and started undergrad at 26 years old. And he paid for it all through by himself, wor working as a dishwasher, um, working as a gas, uh, gas station attendant, literally in between going to classes, um, literally made a way for himself completely by himself because his entire family uh, was in Nigeria. So if it wasn't for my parents, I literally would not be here today. So they're, they've always been and will always be my biggest inspiration. That is so beautiful. I actually made me like a little bit emotional too. <laughs> no, like props to your dad for the perseverance because I totally understand how that feels, like just a little bit of how that feels and the fact that he had that much perseverance to just go to the end. Congratulations to him. I know, right? That's all around. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all around. <laughs> that, that's for my dad. And it's crazy because yeah. I um when I when I finished my PhD program, um, you know, it was hard. It was, I had felt like this interesting dissonance of wow, I have been going through this thing for such a long time. I've achieved this goal, but now what do I do? Like it's done. Like, what do I do next? And my dad kept reminding me that I'm part of such a small population of people who have actually been able to achieve this. My dad actually went through a PhD program but was in, unable to finish it because he had to take care of his five kids. So there's a picture of me and my dad from when I grad, when I, like when I was hooded and when I finally finished and he has the biggest smile in the world. And I'm like, dad, this PhD is not just for me, it's, it's for us. This is our PhD. So tell them people to call you Dr. Ezeka like they're calling me Dr. Ezeka. Um, Cause this is our PhD. Oh, that is just so beautiful. I love that so much. Yeah, so moving on to my next question. 
Um, what are some of your hobbies slash interests you have while growing up? So you obviously know that STEM was the biggest part, but like, what other things did you get into as a kid and growing up? Um, so I actually really love art and music. I, I, I would say that I sing, but then people are going to try to make me sing. So I sing a little bit on the side here and there. I play the guitar. I used to play the clarinet when I was in uh, middle school and high school. It was one of my um, biggest hobbies when I was a kid. I also used to play a bunch of sports, soccer, basketball. I played basketball up until high school. Um, we used to also swim. My parents put us, like, while they were also super pressed about us doing a lot of, like, educational things, they also put us in a lot of sports as well. Um, we used to play tennis. Um, so I used to do a lot of things. But even up until more recently, um, during grad school, I used to actually curate art and music shows in and around Baltimore. So before I moved to Boston, I was like curating shows and I worked closely with a lot of like artists and musicians in the area. That is super cool. That is such a super cool side gig that you have there. Thank yeah, you. It's always amazing to me to see the connection between people involved in science and like the other areas of STEM and music, like how connected they are. I like to tell people that if you're a scientist, in reality, you're really an artist. You're just, your medium is just a little bit different, right? Um, as an artist, you might have clay be your medium. As a sculptor, you might have a canvas and paint be your medium. But as a molecular biologist, my medium are just cells <laughs> or wax blocks, right? But I'm still kind of creating this beautiful painting of a story that informs people literally the same way a sculpture or a painting can. And um, honestly, it's just been a really great opportunity to kind of like bring these two, what people would believe are opposing worlds, but they're really not together. And I remember right after I defended going to a, a local show thrown by one of my friends, and it was really heartwarming for me to be in this world while there's not a lot of scientists going into it and everyone being like, um, wow, you're a doctor. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a doctor, but I'm here with y'all. You know, what's good? <laughs> and it was funny because there was a, a artist that was like, oh my gosh, I've never met a doctor before. I've never met a Black doctor before. And I was like, well, now you have. Hi, my name is Geraldine. You just met one. So it was really cool to kind of like create a bridge across these two seemingly disparate disciplines and just kind of like welcoming everybody into this world of music, science, art. Um, I'm also a part of, oh, I forgot to mention this earlier, but I'm also, uh, my first couple years of graduate school, my sister friends and sister and I, we um, created this community organization called Field Kids. Um, and it's a community organization based in Baltimore where we work to empower the youth of Baltimore and bring whatever they need to help them be the dreamers of their futures. And we have like, we had, we started off with a book drive at a local um, elementary slash middle school that just didn't have enough funding to have enough books that reflected the students at these different schools. And we also did pre-COVID, we did annual, annual back to school fairs. And at all of the back to school fairs, we would always have something that like, merged art and science so one of my friends she's a fashion designer she would do tie-dye with the kids and then we would also have a table that had like really simple um science experiments the kids would like extract dna from strawberries or we would do this like simple um the, what they call elephant toothpaste it's just kind of like a simple chemical react chemistry reaction that like just shows kids the different types of uh, reactions like exothermic reactions which is a heat producing reaction so the, like elephant toothpaste gets really warm and it's just an, another way to like get people and specifically the youth interested in science in a bunch of different ways it's really cool is your organization still active i know like COVID has obviously halted activities but like has it started up again or are you looking forward to starting up again we're honestly looking forward to starting up again. It's been quite hectic in the recent um, in the recent months with a bunch of us moving around, but we still like I literally have a bunch of books in my in my parents' house to kind of continue disseminating around. So we're working on like just 
coming up with more different programming that will highlight the youth of this area. That is really beautiful. I'm really happy that you have an organization like that to really help out your own community. That's, that's really cool. Of course. So moving on to undergrad, we did touch about undergrad stuff a bit before, but, um, and you also already mentioned this in, sorry. There's always a siren. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, so we touched on this a bit when I was reading your bio, but where did you go for undergrad? I went to the illustrious, I don't know if people call it the illustrious, but I'm going to start calling it the illustrious, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Previously, the president was Freeman Robowski. We have a new Black woman president. I just want to say shout out to Robowski for uh, passing the torch to another Black uh, a person of color, especially a woman. So it was really exciting. But UMBC, shout out to us. And um, what did you major in and what made you decide to pursue that major? And I know we touched on this, but we're kind of reiterating it for- Of course, of course. Um, I was a biochemistry and molecular biology major. I actually started off as a chemistry major and I changed it for a silly reason to be completely honest. Um, I think that I was like scared of doing a certain class. Like it was like calc three or something. And I was like, oh, don't want to do that. But then I ended up being really, really great at calculus. So moral of the story, don't change your major for a silly reason. However, it ended up being incredibly beneficial because I ended up changing it to biochemistry and molecular biology, which I think is probably, I mean, of course, I'm about to say the most biased thing in the world, but I think it's one of the best majors that you could ever pursue if you are interested in medicine or science in general, because you get this really great overview of everything, of molecular biology, cell biology, genetics, but then you also get to understand um, biology at the most molecular level of, at, at a chemical level as well, like how are these different things that I'm seeing interacting at a chemical level? Um, so I think that it's just a really great major that helps kind of like encapsulate all of these different things. Um, and I'm a question asker. So I was always asking questions in my biology classes and they would be like, this is beyond the scope of our knowledge. Then I would get to a biochemistry class and it would bring it all together. And I was like, oh, I get it now. So it was, it was a really, I really enjoyed biochem. So much that That's I did really it for my PhD. That was really cool. It reminds me a lot of how I was in undergrad too. I was also an avid question asker. I actually remember um, when I was visiting my undergrad and I, I was sitting in on like an intro physics class and I asked the question, what is a wormhole? And the professor just looked at me and he was just like, okay, well, let's just try and explain this even though it's not related to what we were just talking. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, and we did also touch on this earlier, and this is the question I was mentioning earlier, but like, what are some opportunities you took advantage of so far that possibly have helped towards your career goals or like your current career status? So you did I mean, mention a few things, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that something that I really tried to do was just go after whatever I wanted, seek out what I wanted to do as opposed to trying to have people throw things at me and tell me about things, right? So like seeking out research opportunities, seeking out um, STEM opportunities at an early age that will, well, and honestly, my parents really helped at the earlier ages, but um, just being open to doing these different opportunity or these different activities that would allow me to be more exposed to um, research and STEM. And it's really cool because there are a lot of different programs. For example, the University of Maryland has this Cure Scholars program that invites, I believe, middle school and high school students to just shadow different scientists um, around their different laboratories and even get hands-on experiences. I literally dragged my little sister in her senior year of high school into a lab and was like, I know that you don't wanna do research, but it'll be a really great opportunity for you to just get exposed to this and learn what it's like to be in a research lab, 
lab because everything that you're learning here is 100% something you're going to have to learn in the future. So just embarking on any type of educational opportunity that I could get and just going for it and then like trying my hardest to find whatever opportunity I could get. Like I would be Googling research opportunities for high school students or STEM opportunities for high school students, for undergraduate students, because I, I didn't know. So I would just do my hardest to just go find out. That's excellent. Everything you said is so true. And especially the fact that like the internet is your biggest friend in finding things. Cause it's so frustrating, right? That yeah. like you go to these institutions and you don't really hear about certain opportunities unless someone either literally brings it to you or you have to search for it on your own because you had the idea in your head. Yeah. And more recently, there's this program that actually kicked off last year that I was a mentor for called Our Future is Science. And so they're actually currently um, recruiting students for the 2023 cohort. But basically what they do is that they, they pair um, two to three students with two to three graduate students and you go through I believe it's a several month long mentorship program and you have different projects through this program and it ends with a capstone project of whatever the student is interested in and this could range from from pollution to energy to molecular biology just any type of like stem that impacts social change um, and it's a really great opportunity for students who think they might be interested in, in STEM to kind of get mentored by different students at different stages um, with different career backgrounds as well. Really cool. And is the focus on high school and undergrad students? The focus is on high school students. High school students. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. So now we're moving on to your career. So you just finished up your fellowship. Um, so what was your favorite part of your job, like during, while you, during your fellowship? Um, wow. So many favorite parts. So I think one of my favorite parts were simply the fact that we got the opportunity to learn, um, so many different things outside of our comfort zones, right? The fellowship was three months. Every month we got a different topic and we were told to explore. These were called explorations. Explore these different topics and come up with a platform um, venture hypotheses based on these different topics that we were given. And I am the type of person that I love to learn a bunch of different things. Um, and it was, it, while it was, a really shortened timeline, it was really exciting to just be able to learn something that I was completely unfamiliar with, even if it was in a shortened timeline. And then my other favorite part was that because when we were done kind of like our exploration phase, at the end of each cycle, we were to give a presentation to pretty much the entire company, including the CEO and president of whatever our ideas were. And I think my favorite part of that was like the storytelling aspect. We got to, because in reality, everyone does, everyone didn't have the capacity to research just as, lo as long as we, the people uh, coming up with these ideas did. Um, everyone weren't ex experts in these different topics that we were researching. So we really had to be able to synthesize this information and then display it in a way that anybody could understand um, in a beautiful story. So I really loved that like science communication, storytelling aspect of it. It was just so much fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. Like I, I love that process, the process of like when you, because it makes you understand what you're talking about better. Yeah. So you're like, I know this. And then you're distilling it so that everyone can understand it and everyone becomes curious and excited about it as well. So that's, that's super cool. But you had that opportunity as well. Yeah. And then um, the other, oh, I actually almost forgot about my most favorite part. So because we are not exactly experts, we haven't been researching these different topics. We also got the opportunity to speak to key opinion leaders or what we would call KOLs. And the coolest part about 
honestly, each of the different cycles was sitting down and talking to experts in the field, pressure testing our ideas, and just kind of like going back and forth. It was honestly one of the most exciting things to sit there and be like, I know that you've been researching this for the past 30 years, but I have a insane idea. Let me tell you about it. Tell me if you think this will work or not. And a lot of times some people would be like, that is a really interesting idea. I don't know if that would work. Sometimes people would be like, no. <laughs> no, that won't work at all. But the people that said, no, this wouldn't work were still just as, val honestly, maybe just as valuable, if not more valuable than the people that said it could work because then you could, dive deeper and inquire further about why they believed it wouldn't work and then kind of curtail your ideas to better understand the the limitations of them so cool that you had the space to do that because i feel like a lot of areas especially like within like academia itself is kind of like a very toxic nature of like oh no and they just leave it at that like you're constantly being put down but you were given this space to challenge other people who are experts in the field and also get people thinking and having these juices flowing of like understanding that is really cool I love that you had that opportunity too yeah and um honestly my experience at flagship was incredibly rewarding because something that I had often heard when trying to come up with different or when coming up with different ideas during my graduate school training was that some of my ideas were often too ambitious. And that was something I never heard. I never heard that my entire three months. And I know, I know I came up with some crazy ideas. I know that throughout me and my partners, we had some insane ideas. One of them is actually in the audience right now. Hey, Kenna. Um, we came up with some crazy ideas during that, during our different cycles, but we never heard this is too crazy, this is impossible to do. It was always, give us more ideas. <laughs> we want more ideas, ooh, go even crazier. And that was such a heartwarming, um, heartwarming place to be. Um, heartwarming, innovative, like I, I literally said earlier that being a scientist is the same thing as being an artist. And in this space, it was like you have the opportunity um, to not just be a scientist, but also to really exercise this creative aspect of being a scientist. Wow, that is just so cool. I love that. I love that you had that experience so much. So moving on to my next question, um, what is the most challenging, what was the most challenging part of your job? So you told us the favorite parts. Now, what was challenging about that? So um, it's funny because it was my favorite part and also the most challenging part, learning things that I had absolutely no idea about. There was one cycle where I was working with a bunch of MD, PhDs, and they were all incredibly smart human beings. Um, and the topic that we were uh, discussing was related to specific diseases and um, specific drugs for these diseases. When I tell you in our interest, in our intro meeting, I had to like Google every single word that they were saying because I did not know what they were talking about. And then I like some of our follow-up meetings, there would be times where we were presenting our ideas. And then all of a sudden, all of the physicians would have their physician banter. And I would be like, well, I've never treated anybody before. So I still don't know what y'all are talking about. <laughs> it was honestly like, that was probably one of the more difficult things, but it was also kind of like heartwarming to know that I was not the smartest person in the room. Because I know if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. I always wanna be in a place where I have the capacity to continuously learn, continuously be informed, and continuously educate myself from the people that I'm being surrounded by. So while it was difficult, it also provided me a phenomenal opportunity to keep learning so it was hard, but it was, it was fun. It was a fun hard. I can see that being challenging, keeping up with the banter of the physicians, but I'm glad that 
you <laughs> you had fun during that process. For me, I would just be like, oh, I don't know. I'm just gonna wait till y'all are done. <laughs> I would just be like, oh, yes, mm, that's very interesting. I've never experienced that, too. <laughs> okay, so you told us about your favorite parts, the challenging parts. So what would your typical week look like? Oh, my goodness. Honestly, it would be so say we got the topic in the beginning of the month. Then first week was essentially first day. So what I would try, what my partners and I would try to do each cycle was not look up anything, just come up with ideas. If we were able to, if we were able to solve this problem, what would we want, right? And so we would come up with a list with what if questions, what if this could happen, then this, what if this could happen, then this, because that's kind of like um, how flex the flagship model without looking up anything, without informing us of anything. And sometimes these what if questions didn't make sense, especially if the topic was unrelated to your, um, to your past experiences, your past research experiences. Um, but it would also kind of like help inform even more conversation. So after that, day two, we probably start opening up our computers and start researching. So a lot of the time it was us researching and making slides for our final presentation and for our different meetings that we would have in the interim before our final presentations with our different associates and principals that we were working with. So it was literally asking ourselves questions, coming up, brainstorming, tons and tons of brainstorming. Brainstorming is a lot of fun when you have really smart people to brainstorm with. Um, literally researching I like should probably get blue what are those things blue eyeglasses because of how much my eyes have been staring at computers for the past three months and then making powerpoints and talking to KOL to pressure assess our ideas so lots of meetings still it's really cool I love that the idea of like brainstorming and then refining your ideas to yep. research oh yeah and then presenting them that's it really was like cool. a cyclical process, right? Like you think you have an idea, you think you have a bunch of good ideas, you go to your associates, they kill them all, and then you come up with more, and then you think you're going, and then they kill them all again, and then you come up with more, you talk to KOLs, and then you pivot just a little bit, and then you're like, okay, I think I got something. That was really cool. Uh, okay, so... Another question I have, and this is like a past question that we've got, um, is did your family push you towards your current career and what was the impact? Funny, so I remember when I was saying that I thought I wanted to be a physician, my parents were so excited. They were like, oh my gosh, you know, you know, my parents are Nigerian, so like, you know, every, every African parent wants their child to be a doctor, lawyer, um, my dad accountant, because he's an accountant. Um, and so when I told my parents that I was no longer going to medical school, they were like, are you sure? I was like, I, I think so. I think I'm good. I think I want to do research. Um, for the first year of graduate school, my parents kept sending me different medical school programs that are abridged for people with PhDs. And I think that part of it was just because they, beyond like academia, they were unsure of what you could really do with a science PhD other than teaching. Um, but I kept telling my dad, I was like, look, it's going to be okay. I'm not, I'm not going into academia. <laughs> and I know that I can be successful and wealthy. Come on, wealth. Come on, Black with generational wealth. Um, with a PhD, and I just won't be the person that takes that traditional route of success post PhD. And I know that I want to become an entrepreneur, and that like places like that do venture creation, such as Flagship, will help me get to that stage. So although they were a little bit, um, I don't want to say they were bummed, but I think they were like, okay, this is interesting. I think they had to adapt. That's the better way to put it. They had to adapt to the fact that I was no longer going to medical school, but they were incredibly um, excited about the pursuit of the PhD and are just so 
gung ho about me being a PhD now. Like they literally call me Dr. Daughter um, every day. It's very funny. I love that. I love that they finally came around and was like, okay, we'll support you in this path now. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, there's so many people that you know, like that they know that have um, kids who are physicians. And I think that the, the, the root of success for a physician is very clear. You have a very high paying job. Um, you have all of these different opportunities. Physicians get paid like six figures out the gate, but it's just a really long time to get there. But with a PhD, the route of success, the pathway to success is not as clear. But, um, you know, I'm a quite unique person. I think I could figure it out. Oh, okay. Um, you're, you're close to running out of time. I have like so many questions left. So hopefully we can get through some of them. <clears throat> if not, we might have to skip a few. Um, okay. But yeah, I love asking this question. And it's how do you manage to avoid imposter syndrome and feelings of inadequacy? Inadequacy. So I know you've had a lot of amazing experiences, but with academia, there always comes something, right? <laughs> and you know, it's funny that you asked this question and I remember reading it and I hope you asked this question because I'm gonna be really, really transparent. Um, for, I was in my PhD program for four years and 11 months. I probably had imposter syndrome for three and a half years. I don't think, I think that I had imposter syndrome for the majority of my academic or for my uh, graduate school career, um, just because I was, I was never the person that got um, straight A's through undergrad. I think I got my first 100 on an exam when I was like in biochem and that was like a 300 level class, which doesn't make sense, but I, I, I need the full information to really succeed in classes. And, but I mean, I think that like, it's difficult when you don't see people that look like you in these different areas pursuing the same type of knowledge that you're pursuing. So it's easy to kind of feel like you don't belong or you, or you are not supposed to be there for whatever reason. And for me, I think that something that helped me was building community and then getting mentors and other people that were in my immediate surrounding. Um, I had a really, really great mentor in the director of my program, Dr. Gerald Wilson. Um, I would literally, he used to have a seat in his, his office that we used to call the crying chair. And I would literally go into his office, laugh, drink decaf coffee, cry, show him my excited data, you know, like anything, because I knew that if I couldn't show anybody else any of these things, I would be able to show him. And he was able to help me realize my growth after, um, throughout my graduate career. And then also building a community through the uh, people, the ladies and ladies that I've gotten to meet through Vanguard STEM. Um, Anika Harriet, she's probably one of my best friends. She's also in Vanguard STEM. She's the current acting CEO of Vanguard STEM, but she was also in my PhD program. There were three women, three black women in our cohort. And we were the only black women in our entire program that had come in our year, but building community with them, Ariana Long, uh, Kayla Davis, all of these different people, building community with them and, and leaning on them as not just my friends, but as my peer mentors, really helped me grow through this imposter syndrome because I know that they've experienced it too. And they're like the smartest people I've ever met. And just honestly, just continuously being transparent with myself about how I feel, you know, cause I had imposter syndrome coming through flagship. And I remember talking to a triple certified physician and he was like, I got imposter syndrome too. And I'm like, wow, you know, so like, just being real about it and just continuously working through it is honestly the best, the best thing that you could do for yourself and believing in yourself. Cause that's two chains was said, believe in yourself. Cause who else won't believe in? I love that. I also really love the fact that you had a mentor um, in graduate school that allowed you to have that space to be mm -hmm. and to express the different emotions that you weren't like piling it in on yourself. So. A thousand percent, yes. Like so many people, I think, have really 
been able to kind of like pour into me so that I wouldn't feel like I didn't have the opportunity to be mentored. Even Judaida Eisler, the, um, the founder of uh, the Search Foundation in Vanguard Sim, she's been an incredible help um, over the years throughout this, this academic journey. Um, so just like having different mentors that look like me, um, even now, I literally just got another mentor more recently who is um, the VP of uh, External Partnerships and Innovation at Eli Lilly, Dr. Kristalyn Rose. And she's just a phenomenal, phenomenal Black woman in biotech. And I'm just so blessed to have met her because there are so few. Well, that's really cool. I love that you've been able to gather several of these mentors along the way and people who really support you and see the potential of who you are now and who you'll become in the future. Of course. So, yeah, I love that for you. So speaking of Vanguard STEM, I want to jump to this question because we got to talk about it. What is Vanguard STEM and how did you get involved? Yes, let's talk about Vanguard STEM. I love it. Um, Vanguard STEM is the premier programming for Search and Route to Change Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that uses STEM as a tool for social justice. Through Vanguard STEM, we create and disseminate information that highlights and centers not, uh, non -black, sorry, women and non-binary people of color in STEM. I actually got involved um, because of Anika Harriet, my good friend. She's literally like my PhD bestie. That's I used to jokingly say that she was my only friend in our PhD program. She wasn't, but like we like first day we were like inseparable. And I remember her having all of these different connections and like interactions with people who look like us in STEM. And I was like, how do you, how are you doing this? I need to get involved. And she had asked me, um, excuse me, if I wanted to just join as the social media coordinator. And I was like, sure. So I went through the application process, talked to her and Jedida. And after that, I had joined the team. And it's been an impeccable, impeccable um, group to join. I absolutely adore all of the people working with us. Um, we've gotten to do such amazing things. Um, namely one of our hot, we have the um, different women crush and queer crush Wednesdays that where we highlight these different people. We have our on the Vanguard series where we talk to different people and highlight their experiences. Um, we had our um, different book clubs where we also centered different women in STEM authors as well. And we've also have been highlighting publications from um, different women and non-binary people of color in STEM. Last year, we had our Hot Science Summer, which we talked a little bit about earlier. And Anika and I co-managed and co-directed that event where we were given about $50,000 from a venture creation firm. And we set up and we worked closely um, with experiment.com, which is essentially this um, crowdfunding platform specifically for research. So it was really cool. People were able to submit. And now we made this open to people of all stages and ages. Um, however, our first cohort of people in the hot science set were all ladies and ladies, which was really rewarding. And um, at the beginning of the summer, we actually launched it. We actually had a video um, that highlighted all of their different experiences as well as the experiments that they did and how their projects are going because uh, we partnered with Story Collider who taught them how to do these incredible um, science stories. So if you haven't checked it out, it's really, really cool. And their stories are really amazing, really heartwarming and just cool to see people do the science that they wanted to do. So cool. And also congratulations on the start of that program and all the work you put into that. That's really cool. And yes, people, please check it out. Is it going to start up again for next summer? We're hoping so. Um, we, it, it, the goal is that we will be able to partner with, you know, other venture create, other venture capital firms, excuse me, um, and get more funding because we literally used all of it to give to to give away to the scientists. 
which was really to the STEM creatives, which was really awesome. Um, so hopefully we can get more funding so that we could do our uh, hot science summer event again in the future. That's so cool. Okay, really quickly, I have two final questions that I really want to ask before we run out of time. Um, first and foremost, what does Black slash African American representation in STEM and or tech mean to you? Mm. I'm just going to snap, snap that question because this is so necessary. Um, I think that Black, African American, Nigerian American, whatever, however you identify representation in STEM, it means that not only do we have a seat at the table, we can create our own tables now, right? Um, I was recently having a conversation, I'm gonna try to keep it short. I was recently having the conversation with someone um, about like diversity, equity, inclusion at biotech and like increasing the representation and racial diversity, not just at an associate level, but at the board level positions, at the partner level position. Because when people like us look are at those positions, they'll recognize the lack of representation bottom down, um, top down. So it's so important for us to have representation at those levels because it'll only increase the representation everywhere else people will begin to realize, not just realize, but believe that they can get to those places and positions because, because I'm there, because you're there, because you know all of these different people who reflect them are there in these spaces. That is so true. And my final question is what advice do you have for particularly the middle schoolers and high schoolers who are, might be watching this or will be watching this in the future? Um, for them to follow a similar path as you? Of course, honestly, I think my biggest, my, my biggest piece of advice is always be intrinsically motivated. I had a 10th grade teacher who always would be like, don't, don't try to learn this information just to get an A on the exam because getting an A on the exam is great, but like, have you actually internalized this information? Have you actually, ha have you actually learned, right? So in everything you do, continue learning to continue growing and always ask questions don't ever be afraid of asking what is a stupid question because there's no such thing just keep learning just keep growing and have fun because science is fun and should always be a great opportunity for you to like explore and experience so follow your heart and follow your passions and just keep learning well dr Azeka. Thank you for your time, for sharing your story with us and for giving us insight into the world of tech. To everyone watching, thank you for spending your time with the National Museum of African American History and Cultures Through the Window and Into the Mirror, a career conversation series. Thank you all for your participation and please remember, history is made by doing ordinary tasks extraordinarily well over long periods of time. Thank you everyone for here and Stay safe and have an amazing weekend. Bye, everyone.